classical computer stores and processes information as bits. Each bit can be 0 or 1. Transistors are used for storage and processing and can be either on or off. In the past, the approach to improving computing power and speed involved making transistors smaller and smaller and using more and more of them. Now imagine if transistors could become the size of an atom or even smaller, like electrons. Or maybe we don't need transistors anymore and could build computers using arrangements of atoms and subatomic particles, which can exist in multiple states at a given time. Welcome to the world of quantum computing. Quantum computing using atomic scale components would store information in qubits that can exist as superpositions of zeros and ones. So a single qubit can perform calculations in parallel, making the quantum computer exponentially faster than the classical computer. In 1994, at Bell Laboratories, American mathematician Peter Shore developed an algorithm to factorize a large number into its prime factors. This is known as Shore's algorithm. Here is the mathematical basis. Suppose n is a product of primes p and q. If an integer a less than n is not divisible by p or q, the sequence a mod n, a squared mod n, a cubed mod n, and so on, repeats with a period that divides p minus 1 times q minus 1. In other words, if we consider the function f of x equals a to the power x mod n, then its period is the smallest positive integer p, for which f of x plus p equals f of x, which implies that a to the power x plus p is congruent to a to the power x mod n. So, by trying random values of x, it is possible to get divisors of p minus 1 times q minus 1 and multiply them to compute p minus 1 times q minus 1. If that product is known, p and q can be determined. If p and q are very large primes, the period of repeat may be too large for a classical computer to compute, but not for a quantum computer. In 2016, researchers from MIT and the University of Innsbruck in Austria presented a quantum computer built with five atoms in an ion trap. The computer uses laser pulses to factor the number 15 by implementing Shor's algorithm on each atom. Why is Shor's algorithm important? On a quantum computer, Shor's algorithm can factor a very large integer n into its prime factors in time that is a polynomial of log n. Remember that the RSA cryptosystem that is widely used in secure data transmission today is based on the premise that it is very difficult to factor a large number. Shor's algorithm and quantum computing could essentially put the RSA cryptosystem out of business. Our expert team of five will now explain the steps of factoring a number using Shor's algorithm. The team has decided to factor 21 to illustrate each step. Joe is in charge of step one. His job is to choose an integer m that is less than and relatively prime to 21. Joe chooses 13 and passes this number on to Jackie. Jackie, the resident quantum computing expert, has the most important step. Her job is to find the period of the sequence m mod n, m squared mod n, m cubed mod n, etc. Note that this is the only step that requires the use of a quantum computer. First, she creates the initial state of the system. Jackie calculates q, the least power of 2 greater than 2n squared. This q is used to determine how many qubits she will need. For the number 21, q will equal 1024. The initial state will then consist of numbers 0 through 1023 in the first register, each followed by a 0 in the second. Jackie then adds a copy of m found by Joe to each register 2 and raises it to the power of the corresponding register 1 mod n. The next step is to measure the second register and observe its state. Each base state is equally likely to be measured. This measurement projects the original state into a subspace filled with other base states that share the same observed value. In her factoring of 21, Jackie observes the state 13. She then applies the discrete Fourier transform to the first register as seen in the video. Next, she measures register 1 again. Due to the discrete Fourier transform, 
the observed probability of a state C is concentrated around values such that C over Q is approximately equal to D over the period, where D is an integer. Jackie observes register 1 to be in the state 253. Now hopefully, the hard part for Jackie is over. She takes C over Q and uses continued fraction convergence to approximate D over R at certain intervals. Once a fraction is found whose denominator is greater than n, Jackie can look at the denominator of the previous fraction to find a factor of the sequence's period. Jackie then tests multiples of this number by substituting them into the congruence m to the power of the multiple mod n until the congruence equals 1. Luckily, 2 happen to be congruent to 1, so she has found the period. Satisfied with her work, Jackie passes her work on to Julie. While Jackie had the most important step, Julie has possibly the toughest one. She needs to determine if the period is even or odd. If it is odd, she tells Joe to start over by picking a new number. Otherwise, she is free to pass P on to Jack. The period was 2, which is even, so she is able to give Jack her number. Jack then solves the congruence m to the power of the period divided by 2 plus 1 mod n. If the result is 0, he tells Joe to start over by picking a new number. Otherwise, he passes the number on to John. 13 to the power of 2 divided by 2 plus 1 is congruent to 14 mod 21, so he is able to pass the number on to John. Finally, John uses the Euclidean algorithm to calculate the greatest common divisor between m to the power of p divided by 2 minus 1 and n. Because m to the power of p divided by 2 plus 1 is a non-zero modulo n, d must be a factor of n. He calculates the greatest common divisor of 12 and 21 to be 3, which is a factor of 21. And this concludes the team's work. Their boss congratulates them and says, You guys sure have a talent for factoring numbers.